It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ken Ong. Uh, Ken's parents uh, were born in Malaysia. The two speakers uh, about to speak of us both uh, were actually from Malaysia. <laughs> so a connection has been found. Um, and uh, uh, his parents left to go to the UK when he was two, two years old, so he spent most of his life in the UK and is currently um, at Cam University of Cambridge. He has a long history of involvement, uh, mainly in the area of uh, child obesity, but he's actually, uh, I guess, a person close to my heart, even though he trained in pediatrics and pediatric endocrinology, which is quite a few of us here. Um, he then went on into epidemiology and has further training and, and a post in pediatric epidemiology. So um, we're looking forward to your talk. Um, very welcome to New Zealand, even though you're here for a short time. Um, the title of his talk is The Power of Early Intervention. Well, kia ora tatau. And uh, thank you, Barry, for your introduction. Thank you to you all for your uh, very warm welcome to, to New Zealand. Um, as you know, it's World Sleep Day, and it's currently 2 a.m. in the UK, so... Apologies if my language center gets a bit dozy. But I'm really delighted to be here today and really delighted actually to be, to be part, having been part of a better start uh, at Tipu Eria. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, engagement of investigators across the whole country and with uh, such ambitious aims to find uh, evidence-based and practical solutions to, to make measurable differences. And I'm going to describe today that uh, early intervention does indeed have a very great potential to make measurable differences in the very long term. But first of all, a, a warning to distinguish between the, the rhetoric and the logic, the, the logic or the, the, the evidence. So there is certainly a, a, a lot of... Uh, strong potential for early interventions in short uh, periods of uh, early development to have very lasting um, effects on, on, on later outcomes. Uh, we know from various animal models, this, uh, and then the honeybee, such a short exposure to royal jelly, different type of nutrition during the larval stage, determines whether the bee turns out to be a, a worker or the queen bee with very different uh, anatomical appearance, body size, fertility, uh, and, uh, and, and behaviors. Uh, we know from the uh, agouti mouse, uh, this is a, a mouse which in normal circumstances is a typical brown, lean mouse, but uh, with a particular combination of a chemical exposure and nutrition, not just to the, to the early mouse, but to, to the mouse's mother uh, during pregnancy can lead to a mouse looking very different with a yellow coat color, uh, very hyperphagic, hungry behavior, and uh, a, a severe obese phenotype. In humans, this uh, sort of rhetoric is often based by the, uh, the very rapid uh, neuro, neuro anatomical connections between neurons uh, in the very first months of life. Uh, here with, with uh, particularly language and the, the sensory sense centers of the, the brain. And this is accompanied by a very rapid increase in visual acuity in the very first weeks and months of life. And we know from um, uh, cases of uh, severe uh, visual deprivation in, in children, for example, congenital cataracts, that if this isn't uh, detected and, uh, and corrected in the first few weeks of life, then there are uh, permanent, irreparable uh, damages to, 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 to visual function. And then in the area of uh, obesity here, and the, the, the y-axis is the, the prevalence of obesity in, in young adult life at age 19. And the, the follow-up of the, the, the Dutch famine studies shows that the very early uh, environment has, has a very specific effect on risks of obesity, whether uh, these, are these, these participants are exposed to famine in the late stages of pregnancy uh, or, or in the early stages of pregnancy have a very contrasting effects on their uh, later likelihood of being obese as, as adults. So there is 
strong uh, evidence from animal models and, and these rare disorders, rare exposures of the, 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 the potential uh, enormous uh, power for these early life interventions to have very long-lasting long and, and, and large effects on, on, on health and, uh, uh, and well-being. But I put these examples in the category of, 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 of rhetoric uh, because they're not directly uh, relevant to our current policy uh, agenda. Of course, we should try to avoid famine and, uh, and, and sensory deprivation, but in trying to identify what are the, uh, the, the relevant translation to current policy settings, then we need to answer the, the, the questions of you know, what, what are the interventions we need to focus on? What are the, the, the long-term outcomes that we need to, to, to address? And what is the type of evidence base that we need to, to address these questions? So first of all, a lot of the evidence we're looking at uh, comes from very long-term follow-up of uh, cohort studies. And these, I'd say in particular, address the issue of the, 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 the long-term outcomes that can be uh, potentially altered. So an example of, of this is an area of, of literacy. So the, and the UK has a, 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 a fortunate to benefit from a series of long-term follow-up of uh, birth cohorts. The 1970 British cohort study was of around 17,000 uh, individuals born within about one week of, uh, of each other in, in the 1970 with a, a, a regular series of, of, of follow-up and shows that poor speech and language at age five uh, uh, predicts very long-term effects on, on, on literacy and employment uh, and, and other health outcomes at age 34. Not you can sh sure you can see these uh, uh, data, but whether it's specific language impairments or non-specific language de developments and the various models adjusting for various confounding factors shows a very lasting uh, detriment of these early life impairments. And this uh, speaks to the, the potential very long-term disadvantage of the, 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 the inequalities in, in language development start, starting in, in very early life. So this uh, uh, shows the cumulative number of, of, of words uh, by age three years old, the vast difference between families of uh, pro pro professionals or, or other disadvantaged uh, families. So these trajectories uh, can start from very early life and have very lasting uh, impacts. Just to point out, this slide is uh, from the Heckman uh, uh, Equation Foundation, uh, run by James Heckman, who's a Nobel laureate in economics from, from Chicago, and I'll come back to some of his work later. In the area of mental health, the, uh, again, the, the, there are many uh, recognized uh, long-lasting um, impacts uh, on, on, on mental health of early life exposures. This recent report from the World Health Organization on the social determinants of mental health uh, identifies several childhood indicators of, of adult mental illness from, from uh, central nervous system damage, neurological vulnerability, uh, quality of parenting, uh, and other types of uh, early life adversities. Cesar Victoria from University of Pelotas in Brazil has uh, sort of championed the, the, the considering sort of the, the, the totality of many of these uh, uh, disadvantages in, in the term human capital. You can see this encompasses uh, education, adult income, as well as some uh, biological and, and, and health outcomes. And they've shown, uh, particularly in their follow-up of, of uh, several birth cohort studies, in uh, lower and middle income countries that uh, these uh, human capital outcomes have many early life biological correlates, uh, particularly shorter mother's height, low birth weight, underweight, and stunting in, uh, in, in, in early childhood. And in these lower and middle income countries, the short stature or, or, or stunting is a phenomenon which occurs in, in, in the blue line. You can see it occurs very early in life, particularly in the first two years of life, and then remains uh, fairly fixed from, from then on, um, again, pointing to the importance 
uh, of, of these very early life exposures. I put the adult cardiovascular disease markers in, in, in brackets. In his studies, the, the, the cohorts are only in their uh, early uh, adult life, and they often use uh, biochemical indicators of uh, later disease risk, body adiposity, uh, 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 insulin resistance, and uh, often show that early life undernutrition may have some benefits on, on those markers. Actually, when you look at hard outcomes, uh, early life stunting is uh, as, as equally bad for later health as it is on the, the, the measures of, of income and, and education. And some of our, my work with the 1946 birth cohort in, in the UK shows that those who, uh, participants who were stunted uh, in the shortest quintile by age six years had nearly double the rate of adult mortality up to age, age 65 compared to other uh, children. And this is not a historical cohort. It started a long time ago, but this, these are today's 70-year-olds in, in, in the UK, and the, the, they were relatively stunted uh, compared to later birth cohorts in, in, in the UK. And this is re really the one of the, the, the biggest, has the biggest impacts on uh, adult mortality, second only to, to, to smoking. So obesity seems to be a complete opposite of undernutrition and, and stunting. I guess in terms of weight gain it is. Where it has a similarity is that much of the obesity risk uh, may be maybe set up in very early life. And this was a very simple comparison that, uh, that we did in the ALSPAC cohort, just dividing those who, uh, children who showed very rapid weight gain in the first two years of life and those who didn't. And, uh, and you can see, dis uh, despite many protestations by uh, other, other health professionals and, and, and parents, um, on the right-hand side, if infants do show rapid weight gain in the first two years of life, then that excess weight this tends to maintain th uh, throughout childhood and contrast in those infants who, who don't show rapid weight gain in that period, then on average they stay around the, 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 uh, the average weight uh, trajectory. And these sort of findings have uh, shown a lot of interest then in, into the nutritional and the behavioral uh, possible exposures in infancy that may drive rapid weight gain. I think important uh, understanding there that it's, it's not just about uh, um, what parents do and, and the, uh, the practices of, of, of possibly overfeeding of parents, but we've shown through a lot of our, our genetic studies that, uh, that, that these early patterns of, uh, of growth are in, in, ingrained through genetic susceptibility. So we have a lot of uh, genetic uh, factors related uh, such as FTO, these are identified as determinants of adult obesity, adult uh, BMI. And again, in the 1946 birth cohort, you can see that they, they, they do uh, uh, are associated with, with, with body mass index in the 50s and, and, and 60s. But in, if you, in, in this longitudinal approach, the actual, the, the, these, uh, the differences between these genotypes uh, deviates right from birth, and the, the effects on, on, on weight gain are actually largest in the first few weeks of life. So similar to the, 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 the very recent studies from the, 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 uh, from the, the baby led weaning and, 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 and bliss from, from, from Dunedin, shows that it's not just uh, rapid weight gain and overfeeding in early life, it's not just down to uh, the practices of the parents, but uh, uh, parents need, need sympathy and support uh, to, 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 to cope with, with infants who are uh, may, may, may be uh, by nature on, on a, uh, have a higher appetite and on a faster uh, tra trajectory of weight gain. And we talk about overweight and undernutrition uh, in early life. Of course, context is important. And here it's very advantageous that in recent years we have the the WHO uh, standard to set the, 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 the reference for healthy weight gain. And compared to that standard, you can see that the studies of overweight in the UK and the ALSPAC I've shown you, they, they clearly deviate uh, well above that standard in the first two years of life, whereas 
showed you the cohorts uh, with, with stunting uh, are clearly deviates uh, below that. So it's really important to, to when you tr translate this the evidence to understand the, the, the local context and, 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 the, and the setting. Of course, in many uh, lower middle income uh, settings, we are, are seeing a transition from underweight to, to, to overweight. Uh, the, the, the rates of early childhood obesity here, uh, report described by the World Health Organization, uh, remain highest amongst developed countries, but the rates of increase are, are, are accelerating in, in many um, middle-income countries. And in many of those settings, you have the uh, double burden of underweight and uh, overweight coexisting. And in, in these settings, maybe it's particularly important to, 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 to uh, apply the, the prediction tools that, uh, that, that Wayne and, and, and Rachel were describing uh, earlier. And we described that even just a few simple uh, measures uh, can predict the risk of childhood overweight. So mother's BMI, uh, birth weight, and weight gain in the first year of life. Uh, these are area under the curve uh, metrics, we describe them, but values of around 0 0.7 to 0.8 start to become um, cl clinically uh, useful. So just with a few measures, we can maybe distinguish who's at risk of uh, obesity and focus uh, the resources there. So moving on then in terms of to identify the interventions uh, requires quite a, quite a different type of evidence. It requires the long-term follow-up of experimental approaches. And this is quite a challenge. It's quite a challenge to simply to do a randomized control trial in itself, let alone to have a very long-term follow-up. And uh, uh, not disguising the fact that it is uh, uh, daunting, but where they are successful, where the, uh, the early changes are, are, are made by the intervention and long-term follow-up has, uh, ha has happened, these parts, bits of evidence are really highly impactful. And indeed, these are uh, the, 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 the basis of the, the, the evidence that uh, was uh, central to, to James Heckman's uh, theory around early childhood investment. This is one of those, uh, this paper described one of those uh, early randomized controlled trials, uh, the Carolina uh, Abacusadarian project, ABCD, in, in North Carolina. This was a randomized controlled trial of stimulating early childhood environments to prevent the development of mild mental retardation in disadvantaged children. And I'll just I'll take time just to go through the intervention, because I think that's quite important. There were two stages, and it was a, uh, there was a randomization after the first stage so that each one could be uh, assessed independently. And from birth all the way through to age five, there were uh, a very intense intervention with periods of cognitive and social stimulation, uh, interspersed with caregiving and supervised play throughout a full eight-hour day. And the stimulation component was based on uh, uh, emphasis of, of development of language, emotional regulation, and cogn cognitive skills. There was also a nutritional and health com uh, component with uh, meals and a snack during the child care center and also provision of uh, uh, primary level pediatric care. The second stage, school stage, uh, was included home school resource teachers over a, th a three year period. And essentially, the, 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 unfortunately, the second stage wasn't effective, but the early stage had really dramatic uh, I impacts um, on, 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 on measures of, of uh, in income, uh, crime, quality of, of, of life. And this, this is the, the Heckman equation, which is uh, published and quantified even before the, the paper I showed you on, on the, 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 the health outcomes. And uh, already with these uh, uh, adult outcomes was, was clearly beneficial in terms of uh, return on investment in, in, in early life compared to investments in, in, in later childhood. But so in, 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 addition, in addition to those, this, uh, he, he described some really marked 
benefits on health outcomes of these early interventions on blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, Framingham risk score, which is a prediction of heart disease. Uh, this is a, a, a remains a deprived, uh, largely uh, black African American uh, cohort with very high prevalence of obesity, but you can see a quite a marked difference in the rates of severe obesity. When they look back to try and see what were the, the early life uh, predictors of these uh, uh, improvements in health, then you can see there were very marked differences in their overweight status in the very first years of life, particularly in the, in the first one to two years. And these are even more um, impactful if you look at the, uh, the, the distributions of their, of their BMI here at uh, 12 months, 18, 24, 36, and 60 months. And you can see, particularly in early life, almost a complete separation in the distributions of, 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 of BMI. And, uh, and these were modeled to, uh, to, to, to explain about at least half the um, impact on later health outcomes. So again, testifying to the real importance of a very early uh, life intervention. One question in terms of uh, developing and implementing early life interventions, particularly in trials, is to whether to, to make these uh, complex interventions, tackling broad uh, targets or even with multi components, as in the ABC study, or, or, uh, or whether to, to focus these on, on very specific targets where uh, it's easier to see what has made a, a, a difference. There are, there's no straightforward answer. There are uh, drawbacks of, of both types of approach. In terms of the, the complex uh, intervention or indeed the complex target, at the, I guess the, the, the most, one of the most uh, complex targets of all is uh, inequality. And this has been a, a focus of UK government policy uh, for, for over the last 25 years. These are two measures of income inequality. And you can say maybe the, the uh, policy measures slowed the rate of inequality, but to really haven't uh, reduced them at all and are projected to, to increase again. So a, a challenge of uh, uh, tackling uh, uh, targets which are maybe too broad. At the other end, I talked about uh, specific uh, language delay, I'm not sure you can uh, see the text there, but in terms of specific language impairments at age five, then one can work out what are the independent predictors or determinants of, of, of that. In this uh, study I showed you earlier, the 1970 cohort, it was the parent being a poor reader, it was a very was the strongest uh, predictor of that. And one might then want to uh, target your uh, resources in, into improving uh, parent edu uh, reading li literacy alongside the, 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 the child. I guess the disadvantage on that is putting all your eggs in the one in one basket. Whether that will is that really the key determinant and, uh, and the t determinant on, on on its own to make uh, long lasting uh, outcomes. I say there's no particular right or wrong answer there. One thing is is important to recognize is that not all interventions are effective, um, but despite that, that, that certainly if they're not in, it, effective, that certainly reduces the uh, relevance of long-term follow-up, but there still are lessons to be learned. And a recent example of that in the UK was uh, a, a trial of uh, a nurse-led intensive home visiting program for first-time teenage mothers. Is a family nurse partnership. Uh, as say, it was developed in the US and introduced, as I point out, into practice in the UK. So it was uh, uh, rolled out uh, in staged uh, format. So this trial could carry on alongside it, but was uh, say implemented in, 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 into practice. Uh, gradually across the, the, the UK with, with um, up to a, very, a, a large number of uh, home visits uh, from early pregnancy up to two years. 
And unfortunately, this publication describes that this intervention had absolutely no effect on any of the, the key outcomes, whether it's birth weight, uh, emergency, uh, admissions or visits to ER departments, second pregnancy within two years, a referral to social services. So one of the learned lessons here is about the, you know, which are the primary outcomes of, of, of relevance. And uh, I know that the chair of the trial steering committee, Anne Louise Kinmouth, who would argue that there are what, other outcomes which were impacted by this intervention um, around uh, the, the childhood uh, la language development, which says, uh, and other types of uh, attachment of the of the child, which are really key outcomes. But the uh, the ones chosen by the trial are well, the ones who may be more translatable to um, to cost benefit analysis, and uh, even. A a displayed on the, the, the website of the Family Nurse Partnership as an example of the, the cost savings through this, this approach, which are explicitly quantified through the, you know, the, the savings on, on foster care and residential care. And I guess it's disappointing to me in that many early life interventions are, aren't really investments in early life. You know, at, at best, they're, they're, they're cost neutral. At worst, they're cost savings in uh, early life uh, rather than investing in early life for, for long-term outcomes. There again, I do have sympathy with uh, uh, the policy makers. So even if we had uh, very clear interventions which would promise um, in the financial sense uh, rewards in adult life 30 years later, it's a long time to wait and I guess most politicians have employment contracts shorter than some of my postdocs. So maybe that's a, a, big, uh, that's a big ask. And it's a challenge that I've faced in my own research program, which aims to understand the, the trajectory of rapid postnatal weight gain through to early puberty and reproductive aging. We've described many um, adult health consequences of this rapid growth and development trajectory. That again, the, the, and, we, and we are very uh, serious about trying to take forward um, uh, these understandings in, into interventions, but uh, these are going to have, you know, we have to wait a long time for the, for the benefits. And so over the last few years, we have uh, uh, looked at and demonstrated the uh, important intermediate uh, benefits on childhood obesity, education, adolescent risk-taking behavior, particularly following uh, early pubertal development in, in, in boys and, and girls. And I guess to, to strengthen the, the uh, investments in early life uh, prevention, uh, particularly uh, pleased to hear the, the, the work um, going on here to more accurately quantify the, the cost of these childhood and adolescent um, disorders but also to, we need to work to um, help society to, to, to really value the, these child and adolescent outcomes as outcomes in their own right. The other area in case of lessons from the family nurse partnership is to the importance of considering local settings in, uh, in, in interventions. So the, the, the evidence from, from, from this uh, uh, approach was that the, the nurse family partnership, the, 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 the predecessor or, uh, or the family nurse partnership in the UK, which had been tested in three large randomized controlled trials in, in, in North America and had shown benefits of the program across those primary outcomes. And uh, I'm not sure um, why then it didn't work in the UK. It may be that the intervention wasn't effectively delivered, or maybe it was delivered, but the, the drivers of these uh, behaviors and outcomes were different in the UK, or the, the barriers to those uh, behaviors were, were, were different. So it's, I think, uh, um, behavioral research, both quantitative and qualitative, is really, really key to understand um, those. And just in my, my last um, example, uh, um, in, in relevant to um, the, the, the topic of promotion of breastfeeding. Um, we, we, 
formed, uh, we, we found in our, our cohort um, that compared to breastfed infants, uh, infants who are formula fed were associated with easier temperaments. And these were consistent across uh, a range of infant temperaments. They were uh, highly robust statistically and uh, uh, robust to adjustment for confounding. Uh, despite that, we couldn't get a, a journal interested anywhere. They, they really wouldn't even send them out to, to for the paper out to uh, review, possibly because of this, it's a potentially very um, contentious and uh, controversial findings. Um, eventually, we did get it published in a relatively uh, undiscerning journal, PLOS One. And uh, we also, uh, it was picked up before publication by the Medical Research Council um, Central Office press team uh, who are concerned about possible uh, bad publicity around this, uh, th this message. And we worked very closely with them to, um, to, to, really, to, to deliver the understanding of this, uh, this, this approach. And indeed, it did get wide press coverage and very positive coverage, um, including a Daily Mail. And I think this uh, cartoon, I think it's just a marvelously, not just sums up a whole research in one picture, but actually extends it to show that actually it's no, not, not surprising this result in infant. The, the infants are the same as older adults, uh, uh, older children, adults, and uh, changing these behaviors is, is, is difficult. And, uh, and I put that there because uh, communicating these messages, and we had, we had generated evidence which was, which was then ignored until we ha found a, a, a way to, to communicate it uh, effectively. And really, in, in conclusion, I think to, to translate the power of early intervention requires both the rhetoric and, and the logic. And logic was so called invented by ancient Greeks. But actually, the ancient Greeks, particularly Aristotle, recognized the power of, of rhetoric, and indeed acknowledged that most human behaviors, most, most human decisions are more influenced by rhetoric and by logic. And if we want to change the behaviors and the decisions both of policymakers, but also of families, then we need to, uh, I think, neither rhetoric or logic on its own are sufficient. And that's why I'm particularly excited uh, by the uh, vision Mataranga. It's not, not just uh, inclusion of Maori and Pacifica people, but actually we can, uh, it can enhance that deep understanding of uh, communication, uh, engagement, and partnership to, to, to develop and, uh, and, and change behaviors, not just in Maori and Pacifica, but in all uh, population groups. So with that, an acknowledgement to the braided rivers approach, just end by showing you uh, the, the river in Cambridge. <laughs> I'm very, Pleased to see that uh, a better start has indeed got off to a good start, and uh, hope and pray that to ongoing into tranche two, that uh, your travels will be as straight and the waters as calm, enticing, and enjoyable as the River Cam. Thank you. <laughs>